much. All right, please go ahead. So I'm calling the meeting of the uh, Town Services and Outreach Committee for uh, June 13, 2024 to order at three minutes after 10 in the morning. And um, thank everyone for being here. This uh, meeting is being held remotely um, and uh, people can join the meeting uh, by uh, the link um, that has been provided through the meeting notice. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is permitted by the current uh, open meeting laws um, in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I'll start by uh, checking with uh, the committee members who are present. And there are four of us here, which out of five, which constitutes a quorum. Um, we know that Hollow Lord will be joining us, but not until a little bit later in the meeting. Uh, so uh, checking on who, make sure people can hear and be heard. Uh, uh, Bob Hagner. A present. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Over here. Jennifer Tao. Present. And uh, I know that uh, Ilford Boring might be joining us. So I want to introduce, for those who don't know, Susan Waite, who is um, a resident of Amherst, but um, she is importantly the um, regional um, uh, coordinator for um, the DEP, the State Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, to assist communities on uh, uh, waste hauler and other issues. And she can tell us a little bit about what her role is in just a moment. But um, I just wanted to introduce the people who are on the screen. Um, we usually start meetings by um, having public comment, and we'll get to that in just one second. Um, the major topic of discussion is the waste hauler bylaw. Um, there are no town manager appointments, um, and I don't think we have any um, minutes that have been submitted to us for approval. So while those are standardly listed items on all TSO agendas now, um, if there are no uh, uh, nothing to consider, then we just pass over those items. Um, and the other thing that's listed on the agenda is uh, next steps for uh, traffic uh, calming speed limits, safe routes to schools. Um, that doesn't mean that we need to spend time with it, but I did put that on the agenda so we'd have the opportunity. So, Jennifer. Uh, no, I'm just seeing Guilford in the audience. Yeah. Uh, I yep, think I'll bring him in if, if we... Um... I want to hear from him. So that is what the um, plan is, but I think most of the focus today is going to be on uh, trying to increase understanding of the waste hauler bylaw proposal. And uh, because of the, with the committee, this has been assigned to the committee for a while. And uh, we um, have not been able to get to it, but it's important that we do so. So with that, I'm gonna to go to public comment. And uh, if anybody who's in public, I know Darcy DeMont has now raised her hand. So uh, why don't we bring Darcy in and uh, morning, Darcy. Can you hear? You have to unmute though. Okay. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Um, so uh, we usually set a time of roughly three minutes, but um, um, so but uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, share what you want to uh, the comments that you wish to make? Thank you. Uh, my name is Darcy Dumont. I live in District Three. I'm commenting on behalf of Zero Waste Amherst regarding next steps for the waste hauler bylaw proposal. We strongly propose that TSO committee move it forward by giving 
the original bylaw proposal a favorable recommendation. And I, in my comments that I sent to the committee, I put in a link to that original bylaw proposal. Its implementation would be a win-win-win for the environment, for the climate, and for residents' pocketbooks. I want to thank Guilford Mooring for providing the waste hauler responses to the August 2023 request for information, but I am concerned that it took so long. Zero Waste Amherst requested them first on October 16th, 2023. Um, with regard to the hauler responses to the compost services question, um, after looking at the RFI responses, I would differ with some of what was in the summary provided to this committee in May. Um, on curbside compost pickup, it was reported that no haulers provide it, but we do know um, that USA Waste and Recycling, um, although they might be calling their service a pilot project, the project has lasted. Um, it's an ongoing service with no apparent intention to evaluate it that we can see. I know this because I use it. I pay $15 a month for alternate week pickup of my 65 gallon container. Um, and um, I know uh, Councillor Ryan has also used it. And um, so we know that USA is providing it. In addition, although Republic Services does not currently provide any curbside compost pickup, um, I was very interested to see that their statement was that it provides organic, it, provides organics curbside collections for numerous cities and towns throughout the country, uh, a number of them for many years. However, we do not yet have curbside organics collections contract in Massachusetts and are looking for the opportunity to implement one. And of course, they are the service that provides it in our model city, Louisville, Colorado. Casella also indicated willingness to try to implement our town goals on organics. Um, so changing to a con town contract model, uh, the RFI responses and contracts demonstrate that Amherst residents who currently use USA Waste and Recycling would save substantially on waste hauling costs if the town contracted with a hauler. Our own data that you received in the summary stated that. The only remaining question is how much staffing the town would need to provide for a startup and then to implement the program, but that amount, whatever it is, could be included in the fee, uh, which is what other communities do. Um, the resident fees would cover those costs in addition to the um, and in addition to the additional cost for compost pickup, um, as they do in Louisville, Colorado. Um, and we we won't ever know the answer to a number of these questions until we put out a, an RFP with a, a variety of alternatives that the haulers could respond to. Um, most of our residents are interested in and enthusiastic about reducing our waste. They're concerned about methane emissions, about plastic pollution, about PFAS. They are recycling and reusing clothing, furniture, toys, tools, and a lot of other things on a large scale now because they understand what uh, the concern is. They're looking for easy ways to compost. Let's give them the opportunity to make an even larger difference by recommending this program. And the Board of Health can work out the details. Thanks very much for um, moving forward on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Darcy. Um, and uh, if Darcy is still um, watching the meeting, and uh, she, we might um, see if the committee is willing to ever come back and for, to uh, share anything else uh, that, that's relevant. So, what I my suggestion is that we start by um, seeing if we can spend a couple minutes to establish a common understanding of why um, the, the co-sponsors, which include uh, myself, uh, Jennifer, and Alicia Walker, uh, have uh, proposed that we move forward in establishing um, a different system and uh, 
so in in the last and get some discussion of that and um uh, susan um can uh, will be able to help with uh that so let me first introduce uh susan and uh have um susan tell us a little bit about what your role is, which how you've worked with uh, Amherst in the past to try and move this along, and um, uh, what, and then we can uh, just a uh, way of introducing yourself to other committee members. Sure. Hi there, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Waite. I uh, am a resident of Amherst, and. I used to work for the town of Amherst. I worked, I think, from about 2006 to 2012, 2013 as a, a, the recycling coordinator at, at the DPW. I then worked in Northampton for about six years, and I'm now the municipal assistance coordinator for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection in the Bureau of Air and Waste. So what I do is I work with municipalities in Western Mass, um, eh, providing technical assistance about grants, um, helping them get gain access to information, um, coaching them um, if when when possible, um, and just making sure that they have the resources they need to make um, educated decisions about how they're going to handle waste um, in their municipality. So, um, yeah, so that's my role. I have currently a technical assistance grant with Amherst that is, I think, going to be ending soon. Um, and I obviously have a, a little bit of a conflict of interest because I live in Amherst. <laughs> so uh, I would love to see some of the things that happen in other communities that are successful happen here. Uh, if we can swing it. So um, I guess one of the things that I wanted to explain is from my perspective, the whole reason my job exists at MassDEP is because they're, um, they're trying to look for the, they're trying to position Massachusetts better for the future, right? We have some waste capacity challenges in Massachusetts. It used to be that towns were able to accommodate their own trash through local landfills or dumps, right? And, and then we started producing more trash and more trash. And, and right now, Massachusetts has a waste capacity challenge in that probably 25 or more percent of waste has to be shipped elsewhere because our landfills are full. Um, we only have five incineration facilities and they are pretty much running at capacity. We just lost two here in Western Mass. So the the capacity is a challenge, which means that cost um, and um, and vulnerability are are risks, right? So if we are reliant on shipping our waste out of state, it means that they're going to be uh, transportation fees. It means that other states can charge whatever they want uh, to to mm -hmm. accept our trash. Um, and it puts us in a vulnerable position with in terms of um, rail access um, and and cost of fuel and all sorts of things. So what Mass DEP is trying to do is get municipalities to pay more attention to what's in their trash to divert as much poss as possible from that trash. We want to divert anything that's reusable, recyclable, of value, and then dispose of the rest, right? So, so that's part. That's partly why I'm here, um, and uh, that's where my paycheck comes from. So, um, in for, for Amherst, you know, it's just like any other town. Um, we are in a potentially vulnerable position because waste costs are going up. I've been dealing with some towns. Um, around Western Mass who are recently signed hauling contracts. And, you know, the tipping fees are going up, the fuel charges are going up, um, it, it, everything is going up. And, and 
what happens when waste costs too much is um, it, it can be an ugly thing, right? You get illegal dumping, you get all sorts of stuff. So we're trying to rein the costs in. For me, I see this, um, I see this opportunity as a way to address some climate change concerns. Um, that's a, a, from my personal standpoint, because materials management is climate action. If we are pulling out materials and preventing heavy material from being shipped distance, um, that's going to make a big impact, especially if the material is of value um, and can be used locally to enhance soil uh, health, etc. cetera. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to point out is that what this concept does is it leverages the concept of economies of scale in two ways. Um, it, it allows more power in decision-making from the people of Amherst by banding together and, and requesting certain things. It also uh, makes Amherst more attractive to providers to have a large body of clients who are willing and able to, uh, who have a need that is a, it's a more attractive uh, flower to the bees out there who are looking for business, right? Right now we have a script subscription service in Amherst. So it's kind of a little piecemeal for haulers by getting a large group of people together and requesting specific services um, that it's like a big, um, it's like a field of flowers all together instead of scattered throughout um, farmland. So um, my analogies aren't so good. <laughs> I came up with that one really quickly. Can you tell? <laughs> anyway, um, there are lots of reasons why a move like this makes sense, but there are also realities that the town is dealing with, with in terms of, of resources and and a lot of other projects on the plate. So, um, yeah. So your your decision is: Are you going to make the move and? what the best way to get from point A to point B is, given the realities that you have face. So um, I what I can provide is information about other municipalities. I can provide um, um, for across the straight state, right? I have seven, um, seven colleagues throughout the state who work in the same capacity that I do. And through consulting with them, through getting data from MassDEP, we can take a look and learn from other communities and see how this is done in other communities. And, and so that's, that's kind of what I'm able to help with. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So anybody from the committee have questions that they'd like to ask Susan right now or because otherwise, I think uh, looking for hands going up. Um, why don't we do this? Uh, Jennifer, do you want to, um, as a co-sponsor, uh, say anything about why you have been a co-sponsor and what you're hoping we can achieve if we establish new system? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because I'm calling from I'm in a remote place. Um, well, for all the reason that Susan um, that Susan laid out, and for all the reasons that zero zero waste Amherst and um, other residents constituents in my district, some of whom were involved in the Board of Health, that was one of the first issues they brought to me when I was elected for the council the last session. Is they were felt very strongly that they wanted to see waste reduction and townwide compost pickup to be a basic part of the town trash collection service and better recycling um, that would be recycled and repurposed and closer to home. So it, and so I think this is an important way to incentivize trash reduction by having a pay as you throw town contracted uh, waste hauler pr program 
um, and universal compost pickup. I know I, in my family, we're not, we don't right now do a lot of composting and it would, um, I, and I've in residents that I've spoken with, they feel that if it was a basic part of the trash collection service, that it's something that they would do. And I think it's important that we have, that, that we really begin to make it, I hate to use the word mandatory, but just part of what people do, that people are now recycling. We didn't do that 20 or 30 years ago, but that composting be a basic part of what we do. And from the the RFI responses I've seen, the, um, pro, the session I participated in at the MMA conference, it seems that universally towns that contract for their they have a town contracting system that it does reduce um, the fees that residents pay. And they all said across the boards that when they instituted pay as you throw, it absolutely reduced um, trash. Trash was reduced that residents were um, producing. So my concern, I would very much, we have been talking about this for over two years in the council. I would very much like to be able to move this forward. I just want us to be able to go to the council, which includes new councilors that for whom I think if we bring, when we bring this back to the council, it will be their first discussion of the waste hauler of the bylaw and the whole topic that we be able to bring them the information they need to be able to support this and make what they feel is an informed decision. So I guess that's how I come into this meeting is what can, how can we best bring it back to the council so that they feel they have the information they need to make a decision and cast a vote. And I'd be interested like Bob, you know, you, when we had discussions at the last council, um, if you feel that we are at that point now or what we would need to bring back to the, you know, 13 members of the council to be able to move it forward. So let me uh, step out of my role for chairing um, and into the role, my role as a co-sponsor for just a moment, but I'm going to try and limit that uh, so that we can keep the mood, I can concentrate on keeping the meeting going. Um, I think that we've, um, Jennifer uh, and Susan have pretty well laid out the reasons um, why um, it, it's important to think about environmentally reducing the amount of trash that's being um, disposed of as well as economically, <laughs> why it's an important goal. Um, you can go into great depths in trying to read about this, and I have been over the years. Um, I just want to note the DEP um, has a master plan with goals for um, reducing the amount of waste going to landfills, and um, they're fairly ambitious goals. Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, just note that, but... Uh, the pay as you throw is one way of doing it because and, and um, I recently watched a webinar uh, that DEP put on about pay as you throw. And the analogy put forward there was that it's kind of like when we uh, buy our uh, pay for our water and you pay for the amount of water you use, you have an incentive to use less water because you're going to save money. When you buy electricity, it's metered. And uh, if you can uh, save on electricity usage, you, have, you save. And uh, the idea of pays you throw is that if you can, if, if you're charged by the amount of waste that you put into the system that is not compost, not recyclable, um, it encourages you to use those alternatives so that you can reduce the amount of waste and uh, that goes into the system. So that's where the pay as you throw comes in, is it's to incentivize people to uh, 
produce and you, uh, less waste that's going into landfills and uh, it has to be disposed of in that way for the reasons that Susan already stated. Um, and the last piece is, of course, composting, uh, which uh, not only takes uh, waste out of the landfills and uses it in other ways that can be uh, productive, but um, also uh, putting landfill, uh, put, putting compost in the landfill is actually um, uh, environmentally harmful because it creates uh, methane and methane leaks from um, landfills and is part of what the global warming problem is. So those are all of the reasons to, to move forward um, with a plan, but there are challenges to implementing a plan, which we'll get to is the next topic, but right, I wanted to at least get that out. So uh, let me uh, start with George, uh, Councilor Ryan, you have your hand up. Yeah, maybe my question is related to some of those challenges and maybe there's an answer to it and I just haven't gotten it clear in my head and hopefully now I will. Um, maybe Susan can answer this, maybe you or Andy or um, Jennifer, but the pay as you throw, we, we're seeing that waste haulers are moving to automation. Um, nobody, they're trying to get their employees, uh, in, keep them in the truck, um, using the bins. Can you just assure me and maybe explain to me briefly how pay as you throw works under that kind of reality? So, uh, well, as I understood it before, you know, you get a bag and you're pretty obvious how much that you can get in that bag. Then the bag goes out on the curb and somebody picks it up by hand. And um, so they see what's there and they see that you're doing it right. Now it's the system is going to be um, bins. It's going to be uh, trucks. Um, they're not going to be looking at anything. Um, is there confidence that the pay, pay as you throw model will still work in the way that people intend given that reality? Sure. Um, so there's... Um, we call the bag system the full pays you throw because it's it's probably the way that you can best monitor how it works. But the modified pays you throw system is using a cart system like like we currently use. And um, essentially, you have a unit of trash that's allowed or that people pay for um, every week or every two weeks, however your system works. And then if they have more than that, then they pay above and beyond that. So you're just, you're just transferring that concept over to a cart situation. So in some uh, communities, they have a um, 35 gallon cart or a 45 gallon cart for trash. If they, if a, if a, if a, resident wants to have more trash capacity, they can have a second cart and they pay more to have two trash carts then that are emptied at the curb instead of one, right? So it's just, it's using, it's using the cart system instead of a trash system. Now with that, if you, if you employ that system, you don't want to have huge trash carts, right? Because if you get a 95 gallon trash cart and you give that to everybody in town, that is a lot of room for them to throw away a lot of stuff. So there's very, there's, you've, you, you've lost control over how much of, of the incentive piece to reduce trash. So if everyone has a 95, 65 gallon uh, trash can that they can fill every week for a certain price, trying to get them to reduce the trash by uh, diverting more recycling compost whatever can become very difficult so with a pay as you throw system with containers the recommendation is to go with a smallish trash container so that um so that you have more control the other thing is once you've invested in the containers they're good for up to 10 years so you're going to be um, if you go with a 95, 65 gallon trash container, you're going to have 10 years where you don't have any um, or very little ability to get people uh, to to uh, incentivize people to 
look at what they're throwing away. If, if they, you know, it's like going to an all you can eat place. If you get a big plate, you fill it. If you get a small plate, you fill it and then go back. Right. So we, we want them to, we want to give them the small plate so that they think more about what they put on that plate. Does that answer your question, Bob? I'm sorry. Um, or George, sorry. Um, I think I've heard of communities that um, will offer various sizes of carts and you pay by the size of the cart that you have is another mechanism. So yeah, there, there are a couple strategies that you can you can employ. So, but it's a matter of choosing the one that seems right for the community when you set it up. And those are, but uh, Bob, you do your hand was up. Yeah, I'm, I, um, I, I'm basically in favor of this idea, um, but I can see a lot of issues with it, and maybe we have the discussion later on this, but. One issue is, um, you know, kind of patrolling the the waste streams. Uh, it, I mean, do you, would the town need to employ uh, a a uh, you know a, a garbage inspector uh, to go around and look peer into carts and see what what people are putting in the recycling uh, stream versus the, the 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 trash stream versus the compost stream? Um, that's one issue. Another issue is um, a lot of, it's not clear to people what can and cannot be recycled. Um, you know, for example, if you have, uh, you know, a Drano bottle, um, you know, you empty it out, can you recycle that? Um, you know, rinsing it and putting it down the sink maybe isn't quite such a good idea. Um, so there, there needs to be a lot, a lot of education as to what can and can't be recycled. And the third issue that I see is um, you know, what used to be called white goods. I mean, you know, if you have, like you replace a sink um, in your house, you've got a sink now that's could be recycled, but you can't really recycle it. Um, the, the recycler won't take it. And, you know, there are other kinds of large uh, pieces of, you know, if you, you know, there are times when you have to dispose of large, heavy items, and there's no real way to dispose of them other than you can take them to the transfer station and 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 put them there. But um, it's that that's to me as a is an issue that people will want to, you know, put that in the trash, but it it probably shouldn't be. So, what what do we do with the, the big stuff? that that you know in other communities i've been in they they've had a day every like two or three times a year where you could put it out on the curb and they'd come and pick it up so anyway those are just some of the i uh, the issues that i see is arising from this uh, not that I, I again i i support the idea but it's you know it's when you know the there's a lot of issues to implement to, to, to implementation that need to be thought through. Uh, Guilford's hands is up and he might have a response to that question. So that, that, that is something you need to decide when you put out the contract. Every vendor who responded to the RFI said they would be happy to have a bulky waste day. Um, but then again, every service you ask for is a cost. Um, we also, I do not see the transfer station closing during this time period. So you'll still have the transfer station option open unless you decide you want to close the transfer station. But it is something that every vendor said they would be willing to do is have a bulky waste day. Yeah. Um, and the other piece that you mentioned is education. And that I do think is an ongoing piece. And I don't know if Susan has any experience in other communities as to how they've addressed the issue. Those of us who use the transfer station now, and I think that there, uh, Council Ryan and I both uh, use that as opposed to USA Trucking. Uh, 
when you go to the transfer station and you're ready to, uh, and that, that, that is still dual stream as opposed to single stream, which is what USA Trucking is doing, is you go to throw your uh, uh, metal and paper and plastic into the bin where it goes. Um, there's, you know, very good signage that kind of gives guidance as to what can go in and what should not go into the uh, recycle bin. Um, that kind of education um, is well organized for that group, but uh, for homeowners, it's a different kind of challenge. Susan? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk about recycling education just for a second. MassDP, MassDP has spent a lot of energy in the last three or four years creating a public facing website for people. Um, it's called Recycle Smart MA. And I encourage you all to go check it out there. They have a recyclopedia where you can type in any item and it'll tell you whether it needs, whether it can be recycled recycled in your household bin or not. Um, there's There are quizzes, there's social media stuff that you, can be shared. There are, um, there's information about where your, where your recycling goes. Um, uh, there are guides that are translated into 13 languages. So there's lots of information out there. It's just a matter of getting it into the hands of the residents. In addition, the uh, Springfield MRF has, has produced a bunch of videos recently. Um, four or five videos, four of which have been translated into four languages. They're short uh, five, six minute videos about what happens to recycling. So there are lots of great resources out there. It's just a matter of getting them into the hands of, of, of the right people. Jennifer? Uh, I think George had his hand up first, so. Okay. That's right. Uh yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, just getting clarity on our role as as TSO. Um, take, for instance, Susan's uh, very good suggestion that you want to keep your cart smaller. Um, and so is that something that goes into the bylaw? I mean, how much of detail do we get into here? Or are we setting sort of a just I mean, when I look at the bylaw, I don't see that in there. Um, so is that something that's determined by, say, the Board of Health or by some other body that then, you know, creates the the, uh, the RFP. Um, I guess I'm trying to get clarity on what our role is so that we can actually move forward. How much of this detail do we need to decide on here and how much gets decided somewhere else? Uh, I mean, just based upon what the current system is, I'll answer it that way is that right now, uh, with the subscription system that is currently in use, Board of Health has regulations. And uh, so that there's a bylaw that establishes sort of the basic system, but the regulations are uh, adopted through the Board of Health. Uh, I don't, I think that would, might so be we, the model. We would, it might be the model. We would have to decide that. So if we as a committee wanted X, Y, and Z, um, while the bylaw might be more general, in a report to the council, we might say that this is what we think should happen, or do we actually try to put it in the bylaw? Um, or is sounds like I just okay, maybe I'll wait and we'll get more clarification. Yeah. But I'm just I'm just confused about our role. I certainly George, you, you, just... you, you hit mute. Sorry. I sure I hear the desire to move this forward. I share that desire. Um, I'm just trying to get clarity in my own mind of what we have to do as a committee to actually move it forward. Um, the current bylaw that I have on my desktop that I assume is the current uh, document we're working with is not a finished document. Um, now, maybe I have the wrong one. It's not in the packet, first of all. Secondly, um, what I'm looking at has the city of Austin in it. Um, I'm not aware that we're actually doing any work with the city of Austin, but maybe we are. Um, so uh, anyway, that's a, just a practical question. Uh, I'd like to make sure I have the right bylaw in front of me or the right draft. I assume I do, um, but I do would like to have some clarity on what we need to do as a committee to move this forward. Uh, 
we'll make sure that the current proposed bylaw that came from the co-sponsors over a year ago becomes available um, and it gets shared with the committee after the meeting. Um, but I think we need to work. It, it, it was really put forward as a starting place with the understanding that the committee would have to work from it to adopt it um, and address issues if we went forward. Um, so I don't know if there was any, Jennifer? I'm sorry, there's some background noise here. Um, I would actually, uh, Paul probably could <laughs> provide some suggestions or how, because we always talked about it being a phased implementation over a period of time. So we'd start with single family and maybe up to triplexes. So it would be phased in gradually, but at MMA at the session, we did hear that it's, it's, you know, a long, it's not something that starts up quickly, but I, Paul could probably could provide more information about that. So I can try. Um, and I think that, I think that is the approach is, is you would start, with single family home or whatever one and two families choose, and there's a best practice i'm sure for handling that what we're asked what you're what the council is considering is creating essentially a serve a new service that the town provides that it doesn't provide now that's a wholly new enterprise that and and the scale and and what that looks like is still sort of in discussion with with this committee um because we don't, other than the transfer station, we don't provide curbside pickup. That's all privately contracted out. So what the, and it may continue, it will likely continue to be privately contracted. What the, what the request is that we would contract that out on behalf of all of the residents instead of the residents contracting individually. Um, because And the reason to do that is that we would like every resident to be required to do um, organics and also to regulate the size of the bins to in order to reduce the the um the creation of trash so and we understand all the so that's that's the goal i think the way i i'm hearing you um to implement a new department there will be costs on behalf of the town and it and it all depends on what how that gets developed like who collects the money is it the vendor or is it the town who's receiving the the um, complaints and you know there will be calls coming into the town because it'll be perceived as a town enterprise we get calls already anyway and then i think the and then there's an implementation plan how do we get there and how you know what's the time frame for it creating new departments as we've experienced with the crest is, is it, there's a lot of growing pains and things like that we're seeing in the city of pittsfield they're going through a pretty onerous process right now um that's that's been really instructive, I think, to me reading what's going on there, because this is a service that affects pretty much every resident in the town. And not many we don't have many services that that really other than roads, you hear a lot about roads. Um, not many services provide affects everybody and that when you change something, everybody has an opinion. So I think we need to be recognize that and have a real plan for how this is going to look as we start to roll it out. It's, I, I think we all, I think everybody, I haven't heard anybody oppose the goals. I think the goals are, are good. I mean, we all recognize the trash crisis that's out there. We all recognize that reducing trash is, is a value. We all recognize that removing organics is a, is a key piece of the strategy for reducing trash. And it's just, and then the question is, how do we get there? Um, and I think the tool the council is considering is is a bylaw, and that's that's a that's a fine way to do it, you, um, and probably the best way because you're the elected officials driving, you know, making the decision on behalf of the residents as opposed to a, a board of health regulation. I think having our elected officials make this decision is the right path to go. The concerns we have is just the, the internal capacity to make do this, and you know we are already stretched in terms of our DPW staff, um, in terms of taking on additional responsibilities. They have a lot of major construction projects. So I just want to note that as being a a challenge, a significant challenge. And most likely we would be seeking funds to bring in a consultant or an employee or somebody to to make the to work on this. It's going to take time to 
pull this all together in as I said, the or somebody said that this this the education is a gigantic piece because you really are talking talking to every household, and you're saying you're going to do something different, and then there's the capital expense of if if we if if we don't put it in the RFP and we have to purchase the toters, you know that's a different that's a, we just need an implementation plan and a budget that goes along with it, but I think we it's not I I don't think we have the internal capacity to really build that. I mean, Guilford can weigh on this as well. But I mean, we're really fortunate that Susan is here. I mean, she brings a wealth of knowledge and also that, that she, she's our, our hometown person. So she knows us and she cares about us. So that's a huge leg up for us compared to other communities. I'm not sure if I, I don't think I answered your question, Jennifer, but, <laughs> but yeah. But I guess I guess I want to see is, is the committee like, yeah, this is something we want to do. Um, we we're all sort of in agreement with the goals and the strategies. Like, let's lay out a plan to get there. Jennifer, did you follow up? Uh, yes, I don't know if Guilford wanted to say something because he. No, okay. No, I just wanted to. Um, yeah, I think we would. Personally, I would like to see it move forward because, as you said, Paul, it's. The goals are shared probably by many residents in town and but realizing that it will, you know, we have to give the implementation the time that it takes. I did want to ask, though, would it really this is the first time hearing it might would would it be a new town department or just I well, not just, but uh, or a part of staff time, maybe in accounting and contracting? I, I'm trying to get a yeah maybe i did i'm maybe it's not a department we already have a a, a department in you know the the trash is is an enterprise system as it stands but i think we'd recognize that there's there's new chore, new tasks that would land on in different departments depending on what they were whether it's the finance office or the dpw and then in the rfp or the contracting we could have have more or less services that the vendor provides. Yes. In billing and customer service. Yeah. yeah. So all that can be farmed out, but we have to recognize that there'll be there is it's a it's a ta we don't contract with we have to at the very minimum we manage a contract with the vendor, right? Just note that uh, in some of the things that we've received from zero waste hammers, they have suggested that it will need staff in uh, DPW and finance department and to take care of administering the system both financially and administratively. Uh, but, you know, the question is, uh, they made an estimate of the amount of part-time staff. Um, how do you pay for the part-time staff, how do you deal with part-time when is, if, if it's a fraction of a job, what do you do? Are you hiring a part-time person or are you giving a fraction of a person? So there's management issues that uh, we would be uh, putting on our um, on our staff and that would be Paul's responsibility and people who work with Paul and um, it's not always as easy. The other thing is how to pay for it because uh, to have uh, have it work into the town budget as our uh, finance committee chair, who's also a member of this committee can tell us that may not be that easy. Um, it would uh, be, if, uh, it is suggested that to be built into the enterprise fund and be part of the charge that is uh, made to uh, users of the system uh, through the enterprise fund charge. But uh, just doing those calculations and determining it is a challenge in and of itself. So uh, those are the kinds of uh, things that need to be addressed if we're going to implement such a system. Councilor Ryan. So I guess I want to come back to, uh, again, the question of process and our role in this. Um, a lot of this sounds like things that we don't 
determine or discuss. Uh, we don't decide the staffing issues. We don't uh, do any of this. Um, it's certainly important that we are aware of the concerns that Paul has and staff has, and we need to be cognizant of that. But it seems like at this stage, um, we don't have a role in that, or someone needs to explain what it is. Uh, I don't think we need to talk more about the challenges. We know there are challenges. The question is, do we want to move forward and send this to the council and say, we think this is something we should do? Um, and then the question becomes, does that then fall on the lap of staff and they have to spend out countless hours trying to craft this, deciding what goes in, what goes out, et cetera, et cetera. Do we hire a consultant? Um, do we create a working group? Um, I, you know, again, that seems like that's a decision made by somebody else. Um, unless I hear from, from Paul or from town staff, that, look, we just can't handle this, please. Just, you know, uh, I think our job is simply to get this bylaw, uh, which seems like it's pretty much ready to go, um, to the council with our recommendations. Um, I guess I'm trying to understand what are further things we need to discuss and decide here. Um, what are they? Um, Susan, did you have a response? You had your hand up a moment and then. I, I was just going to say that, um, I wanted to, I just wanted to kind of, um, put things into perspective this whole enterprise is it makes a lot of sense in many many ways and it's a big chunk i mean paul paul explained um it some communities move to a pay as you throw system some communities want to start composting curbside some communities want to move from a subscription system to a municipally managed um uh and and contracted system amherst is attempting to do all three of those things all at once so it's a big project and so i just want to you know it's it's not going to happen overnight and and all of this thinking and planning is going to be important um i, I just wanted to you know it's not a slam dunk because these are three really big changes that you're trying to push through. And so um, that's all I wanted to say is it's mm -hmm. it's um, it's not something that we're just gonna wake up and it, everything's gonna be perfect. You know, there, there's some, some big changes that you're trying to implement. Okay, um, sort of lost track of who's uh, next in line. I uh, guess it's Councilor Ryan. I sound like a broken record and I apologize, but um, I hear Susan, I hear Paul, I hear Guilford, I understand. I'm just trying to figure out what our role is. Uh, are we going to spend the next uh, three months uh, discussing this sort of stuff? Uh, and to what end? Um, I think there's a broad consensus that I'm hearing from uh, people on this committee and we're hearing from constituents, at least the folks who pay attention, that we want to move uh, our town to uh, this kind of system, um, pretty much is spelled out in the bylaw. If someone on this committee thinks that I'm wrong, they should speak up. Um, if there are certain issues that we still need to resolve as a committee related to this bylaw, then they should speak up um, and tell me what it is we need to work on, and then I'll be happy to work on it. Um, as I said, so that's what I'm trying to get clarity on, what, what our role is here and what's left for us to do, if anything, other than to get this cleaned up and get it to the council with our recommendations. Milford, did you? I, I think Council Ryan is right. Uh, you are, I mean, we, you're at the point now where you need to say, yes, we want to do it, or no, we want to do it, we don't want to do it, and set that, send that to the council, and then let the council make the formal recommendation, a yes or no, and then it comes back to the town manager, and we sit down and say, okay, this is how we can move it forward to the next 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 step. And that, that's where we are. We're just, I think that's where you are. And that's really what has to be decided. Yes, no, move it forward, move it not. Sorry. If I could just jump in. And I think Councilor Ryan also said there, you know, you can hire a consultant, you can do staff, or you can put a working group together. There's different pathways forward. But I think the, the threshold question is, does the council want to do this or not? So, um, Bob, 
Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking now as as uh, from my position on the finance committee, and I, I, I see that this would require significant town resources, uh, especially during startup. And that's the that's the rub. What do we do? I mean, once the system is up and running, we can whatever staff time needs to be devoted to this can be you know, rolled into the rates that people pay and can be funded. So that's not a problem. The problem is the in between because it's going to take staff time to figure out how to implement this and then get it started. And we're going to, you know, the, the talk was we would start slowly and build, build up. And so, but the person or people who have to implement this are going to be there from the start. Um, and so that that to me is the rub is is where do we get the money to start this this up, and then once it's up and running, it's a separate issue I think. But you know that's just something that the the you know the finance and the town manager and the the, the finance committee are going to have to struggle with. Susan may be able to help answer that question because of uh, either DEP or federal. Uh, support that might be available. Uh, don't want to put you on the spot, Susan, but if sure, you... no. Uh, so, so um, Mass DEP has a has a couple of grant opportunities. Well, one, we have some grant opportunities to help fund things. So there's a pay as you throw grant that um, helps with um, uh, c purchase of of trash containers. Um, if you purchase a certain size of container, because that's the way they incentivize the small size. Um, but the, there's some other resources that are available, um, and it's a certain amount per household. Um, there is also money from the Recycling Dividends Program. Um, Amherst, I don't remember how much you were awarded last year, but um, you are, I think it's something like $10,000. Um, that you get every year. And now I know that Guilford and Steve have been using that in other ways, directing it in other ways, but that can be used, that money can be used to hire a consultant or to hire a part-time person to work on waste reduction uh, uh, issues. So that there is there is that money that in theory is available, but again, um, I know it's been... Um, used in the past in other ways uh, by Guilford and Steve. Just recently, I forwarded some information to um, many of you here. I, I don't think I sent it to George or Bob, um, but uh, about a federal grant. They're, they're really trying to push at the federal level, trying to push more composting. And there is a grant that uh, is due, I think the applications are due sometime in September. Um, to promote composting in the United States. And so, and it's a grant for municipalities and um, other, you know, regional entities, et cetera. So I don't know a lot of detail about that, but it's possible that, that there's something there. Those are the, the primary opportunities I'm aware of. There's also some uh, the Recycling Partnership has a cart grant where they will give, I think, $15 per cart towards recycling carts, purchase of recycling. So those are the types of things that I know about, um, but there isn't a, a there isn't a, an easy, you know, magic wand uh, to, to make it happen financially. Hey, thank you. Um, take a moment. Council Lord has joined us, but then she needs to. I just asked, uh, can you uh, hear us and be heard? And we'll tell you where we are. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, we have been entirely in a discussion about why we want to move forward with the uh, or uh, or how sort of the question of whether we should move forward and why we would consider moving forward with establishing a new system for waste hauling. Um, and uh, the easiest way for you to catch up on this is to check with Athena later. 
about the link to the meeting and watch the beginning of the meeting that you missed and then you catch up with us. Will do, thank you. Where we are, and that'd be probably the easiest. Um, and I think that Jennifer had to leave. She had told us that she was limited because of uh, her demands on the day. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, where we are at, let me see if we if there's agreement to this, is that there seems to be support for uh, getting going back to the council with an explanation of where we are and sort of ask the council question of that whether they the council wants us wants us generally the town to move forward with establishing a system and then the other question that would come up is uh, one that Councillor Ryan has brought to us uh, several times during this conversation is what is the role of this committee um, going forward and um, how should we do this? And I think that there have been a couple of models that have been thrown out. One is to do it through the committee. The other is to um, do something that would be similar to what we have been, what we did with the uh, solar bylaw of uh, getting a um, some kind of task force to actually um, take on the issue that does not have to be entirely counselors and make a recommendation. So that would be another path. And third is uh, uh, the staff assistance that would be needed and whether uh, uh, grant opportunities are available to uh, help us to do that. So those are the kinds of things that I think that we are at right now. Uh, Councilor Ryan? So to get ready for this meeting, um, I just I took a look at the carryover memo that we got at the beginning of uh, you know the year uh, when we started, uh, specific to this particular project. And um, if anyone goes back to look at that, they'll see that Many of the things that the carryover memo um, suggested would be next steps for TSO on this particular issue have been, uh, I think, uh, addressed. But there are two that I noted that um, I'm not sure that they have been, or maybe they haven't. It's not an issue. And, and one is um, providing listening sessions for the public. Do I, are my colleagues com are they, are they comfortable with going forward to the council, which I think we'd all like to do, without taking some time, at least once, or you know, to have a listening session so residents can come and ask questions and get learn a little bit more about this before we, we take the, the final step of going to the council. That's a question. I'm not sure where I stand on that, but my sense is, I could be wrong because I'm new to this, uh, just having got to this council, this committee, but my sense is that we haven't had any listening sessions. I may be wrong about that. There's certainly been a fair amount of public input, um, but have we had listening sessions? Do we want to have them? The other is the Board of Health. And again, this may have been something that's already happened, but the, the carryover member says we should get some input from the Board of Health. And I think we have a new um, Board of Health uh, director, and I think it would be interesting to have her come and talk to us if that's appropriate. So other than those two things, uh, listening sessions for the public and input from the Board of Health, I think looking at this list, we've pretty much done everything that we were asked to do prior to then moving on this. I think they're both good suggestions and thank you. Uh, we have not done a listening session ourselves that I am aware of, though I do acknowledge that Zero Waste Amherst um, did quite a bit of surveying earlier um, in the process. And uh, uh, so we know that they had did one round of reach out and our, a group of, uh, that is available to help us to do, uh, to put together some kind of public forum again to sort of serve as a listening session, whether in person or virtual, uh, if we choose to do that. Um, certainly the, the uh, carryover memo was largely the impetus of um, 
another one of the original co-sponsors of it, which is uh, former counselor Shalini Ball Milne. And uh, she's very much a supporter of uh, public engagement as a part of any process. Um, and the Board of Health uh, has uh, indicated their support, but it's been a while and I can reach out to the chair of the board and uh, talk to her about it, uh, make sure to find out where they are with it now. So those are steps that might be logical to take. And uh, my suggestion is that we not make a decision today on moving forward, though if somebody feels differently, they should speak up. Uh, but that we uh, try and uh, organize our next steps uh, after this meeting, uh, to, I will give some thought to how to do that and reach out to the Board of Health and others and uh, see if we can uh, uh, develop uh, something to present to the Council that has the content of today's discussion so that we can move in the in a direction but um, of what it is we're presenting to the council and what we're asking of them. Thoughts, comments? So uh, would it be okay with the committee if I try and take today's meeting and uh, summarize uh, the discussion that we had and uh, present it back to you kind of in the sense of a, a draft committee report and uh, that uh, that, we, that would be a topic then we can discuss at the next meeting. I would support that. Okay, so that's that why don't we proceed in that basis and uh, um, I think I will also reach out to Zero Waste Amherst and um, maintain contact with Susan about um, how to proceed. But uh, I guess that um, I would be hesitant to um, ask too quickly for uh, council to do something because I don't think that we're there yet and ourselves as to knowing what to do. So, George, anything else on this topic? Yeah, I guess I'm of two minds. I'm arguing two sides of a question, but that actually is a very ancient tradition of trying to figure out how you want to actually get to something that you are happy with. Um, I would like this to be done with. I'd like us to move forward. I think most of us would like to get there. Um, I raised the issue of outreach to the public as a question. Uh, do my colleagues believe that we really we do need to have a listing session? Uh, I'm not sure where I stand on that. That's a question. Um, and maybe the answer is yes, we do. And so that's going to delay things a little bit. That's fine. But I think it's we owe it to the sponsors and to our, our, you know to the public at large to give them some sense of where we're headed. Um, and so um, one suggestion I would have is put the, 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 the proper form of the bylaw in our next uh, meeting packet at our next meeting, and uh, we should vote on it. Um, but if we feel that we need to hear from the Board of Health, and that's a question, then uh, that's something we need to do. And if we feel we need to have a listing session, then that's something we need to do. But if we don't think that's uh, needed um, for whatever reasons, then I think we should go ahead and uh, get this bylaw in the proper shape and have it at our next meeting and we should make a decision. So uh, if people, I just need to hear from the rest of you, that's where I'm at, um, but I need to hear whether you want do you need some more things you need? What else do we need to do? Do we need a listing session? Good. Let's let's schedule one. Do we need to have the Board of Health come and, and just talk to us? Then let's put them on the agenda. But maybe we don't. Maybe we're at the point um, where we can simply proceed and listing sessions can come later. They can come after the council gets this. I, you know, it's a question. Um, and I really don't want to leave it sort of just, well. <laughs> we'll see what happens at the next meeting. I, I just don't want to do that. I, I want to have a clear sense of what's going to happen at the next meeting. 
with this issue uh, or whatever meeting we're going to have it at what's what's the plan uh, yeah this is a question maybe for athena uh do does the um the council need to hold a public hearing on any new bylaw bylaws require two readings um and the council has also referred this to i think I think this was referred to TSO with input from finance committee. So at some point, um, there will need to be a discussion and recommendation from finance committee. Okay. Councilor yeah, Ryan. This is a big change. That's clear. It's a big change for the town. It's a big change for the people who live in the town. Do you as the elected representatives of those people feel that most people are aware that this is coming. Obviously, uh, Zero Waste Amherst knows about it, and those people who have engaged in that know about it, but I'm not sure the vast majority of our citizens are all that aware or knowledgeable. Um, what is our role in making them aware or knowledgeable of this before we proceed to the council? Um, should, is that something we should do as a committee? Now, maybe only five people will show up. We all know what that's like. But, um, or maybe once it gets to the council, there'll be a series of, of uh, outreaches to the public, but there's only two readings for a bylaw and that, that's less than a month. So um, it's a question. I just would like to hear from you all what you, know, what you think we should be doing. I feel most people aren't aware of this. They probably support it, but I don't know. Um, and so mm -hmm. I just wanna make sure people know that this big change is coming. There are many ways to do that. One way is a listening session by TSO inviting the public to come. We tell them what we're doing, tell them, right? And then we have them ask questions. Um, do we want to do that? Or do we want to proceed to simply, you know, moving the bylaw along, which is something that we could certainly do and I would like to see happen soon. Let me see what Bob uh, has to say and then I'll respond too. Yeah, I, I agree with you, George, in that I don't think most people know this is coming. Um, however, I don't think a listening session at 10 o'clock on a th Thursday morning is going to have enough of an impact that suddenly the people of the town will be, be aware of things. So I don't have the answer, but I think a listening session is not going to not going to reach enough people to, for that to matter. Well, it couldn't be at 10 o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's for sure. <laughs> but we'd have if, to have it. It have to be an evening session. It have to be a special meeting of the committee. Even if we had it in the evening, I mean, you, you know, you you you're you you know what? How many people show up to those meetings? That's I understand, but I know I understand. But I mean, I I think somehow sending out a message to people would be more effective than you know doing okay. you know outreach uh, the way that. I understand outreach, which is more positive. You do something to, to reach people rather than sit back and have people come to you to, you know, that that is not outreach in my mind. So, so you, yeah, my thought when I was making the suggestion earlier about um, putting together some kind of report that would now go to the council from the committee and the, that be what we do as the next step um, is partly because I recognize that we need to inform, we need to educate the council who, counselors who have not been involved in this issue. But it also is a way of reaching the public because um, just having that kind of document and even brief discussion at a council meeting is one way to uh, inform the public in addition to informing the council. And uh, if it gets picked up by uh, the Gazette or in Bulletin or however, uh, you know, the uh, other publications that exist uh, might be able to start picking up on the issue too. I think that uh, the goal is to sort of broaden the discussion, and that was it, that was a way of broadening the discussion, and that would lead to a more uh, productive listening session. George, 
That's all right. So good. I mean, hearing, uh, I don't know uh, what Hala thinks, uh, and, and, and she may not have a view on this, but what I'm hearing from at least three of us is then, or I would suggest is that at the next uh, TSO meeting, we have this bylaw on our agenda and that we vote on it, that we move this forward. That's what I would suggest. Um, uh, unless again, say the Board of Health, we need to hear from the Board of Health. I, I'm not hearing that from anybody. Um, so I would say let's, uh, I would ask the chair that this be put on our agenda for the next meeting and uh, in the proper form, the bylaw, and that we vote on it. Um, Council Lord. I am in agreement with putting this on an agenda and moving it forward. I was racking my brain about how do we let people know that would need to know um, what are different ways to get them to the table if they have um, an opinion about it. And I would also like maybe like to ask Amber Zero because I know they did a lot of door knocking and, and yeah, but yeah, so I'm in agreement with, with moving this forward. Thank you. Uh, Athena? As I mentioned, um, part of the referral was um, for TSO to get some input from finance committees. So I think it would be appropriate for that to happen probably before uh, TSO sends this back to the council with the recommendation. Yeah, I guess that uh, uh, following up a little bit of what Athena said, I'm a little bit hesitant to say rush this, uh, rush about the council. I don't think that we have work through the details of it yet. Um, Council Lord, your uh, hand is still up. And... Okay, uh, Councilor Ryan. When this goes to the council, it will go to FinCom. I don't understand why we would be sending this to FinCom or, or asking for their input. Um, it goes to council and at that point, FinCom can weigh in and it will. Um, so again, uh, and this has been going on for, you know, a long time. I mean, what the, what more detail needs to go into the bylaw other than correcting some typos and getting the font right? Um, uh, the sponsors are here, two of them. They can tell us. Uh, is there something in the bylaw that needs careful attention? Um, anyway, that's what we do at the next meeting. Um, so I really, uh, I want to push back a little bit about input from FinCom uh, at this point, uh, unless somebody has a better argument. Um, that will take, take place once it gets to council. And if the council decides to act on it, maybe they'll just say no. But uh, I don't want to wait yet again for another two, three, four weeks uh, because FinCom's busy with other things. Um, and so let's let's get this thing Let's get this thing forward, okay? Dina? I'm just curious to clarify your comment, Councillor Ryan, if you mean that the council would then refer it to finance committee or at what point are you saying that finance committee would weigh in? Because um, in the if past, has, when something has, has if I could just finish my comment, if in the past, what has gone through TSO with input from finance committee is that those things have been coordinated before um, a recommendation is made by TSO. So I'm just curious if you could clarify, please. Thank you. When this goes to council, if it ever gets there, um, there are clear financial implications as Paul has made clear today. And so it will go, it will go to FinCom for their input on the financial implications. How is this going to be paid for? How are we going to manage the, uh, the first, at least the first phase? Uh, 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 Bob raised those questions and they're real. And and so, but that we're not going to. That's not going to get settled uh, in the next two weeks by FinCom, or three weeks, or four weeks. Um, so I would assume that something like this that has genuine financial implications would automatically or go to FinCom for their input on what those implications are and whether this makes sense financially and how we'd pay for it. And if it came back to the council and said it doesn't make sense financially or we can't pay for it, then that would probably be a problem. So that's what I meant by it. I can't comment as further because I have to admit that it's been now uh, 
a substantial period of time since I've last looked at the bylaw that is first presented to the council to see uh, what needs to be changed. I just remember that my reaction at the time was it was a base to start from, but that it needed work. And I need to go back and, and look at it again to respond better. So I think that getting that bylaw to the committee makes sense uh, because others will look at it too and think about the same thing. Susan? I'm going to um, confess um, ignorance here uh, um, uh, as to the process. Is it TSO's responsibility to get the bylaw into shape or does that happen after it goes to city council, to town council? I, I I just don't I don't understand the the process. So if somebody could enlighten me, I'd appreciate. Lena can uh, jump in on this too, but uh, I think it's the com that the council expects that the committee has done that work. Andy, if I may. Yes. Thank you. The council has referred the draft bylaw to TSO. Um, to make a recommendation in consultation with the finance committee. That was the original referral back in August of 22. And then um, our governance organization and legislation committee is charged with reviewing by bylaws for clarity, consistency, and actionability before they come to council for a final reading and vote. So. So in that in that vein, I I'm still not quite understanding how the uh, how TSO would make a recommendation without first consulting with finance committee because that was part of the referral from the council. George, yes, Ryan. Well, this is the first I've heard of this. Um, so what can I say? Um, I've not been on this committee for two years plus, and uh, I guess I wonder. What, yeah, um, I don't know what to say. It's going to take forever. Um, and then it will go back to FinCom once it gets to the council. So, and I, what are we asking FinCom? We're going to ask them whether we can afford it. Um, we have the chair of FinCom present. Maybe he can tell us whether they have the bandwidth at this point to do a deep dive into how this is going to be paid for, because that's the question. Um, and if the answer is we have to do this, and then we could ask the, the chair, realistically, when does he think he could, his committee could look at it and get back to us? Is that another month, two months? I, you know, it, it's like, and then it's gonna come back to them again. Um, so I need some help here. I, yeah, I'm frustrated obviously, but uh, if we have to do it, we have to do it, but um, yeah. Athena. Just to clarify, George, it wouldn't go back to Finance Committee if Finance Committee had input. Um, so the referral that's in the carryover memo, it's mentioned in your TSO carryover memo that you should have seen at the beginning of the year, just to let you know it's, you know, it wasn't uh, buried somewhere. Um, it was the referral came with uh, instructions to consult with Finance Committee. So the council, my understanding of the process would be that the council wouldn't refer it back to finance committee after that it would go um it would come from tso and finance to gol for a final look over on the bylaw language and then it would come to council for action thank you so councilor ryan so i guess i ask you my colleagues on the committee what are we asking fincom to do basically to tell us whether we can afford this, how we're gonna pay for it. That seems to be the question, correct? So can we get that back by two weeks from now? Bob? I don't think it's realistic to have it back in two weeks. Um, we have a lot of other things on our plate that we have to deal with next week. Um, we have a meeting that's scheduled for June 25th and one scheduled for July 2nd. I don't know whether we'll hold those meetings or not because we've been pretty busy over the last month or so with budget. So, um, you know, to, 
you know, I, I think I can certainly consult with the committee to see whether they're, they think we can take this up. Uh, it seems to me that the issue is really the sort of transition startup. Um, I think, I think that's the, the affordability issue in terms of the town staff. Um, it's not really, I, you know, whatever, looking at the, the, um, the contracts for waste hauling as compared to what we're paying, there's plenty of room in there to staff up, you know, positions in the town and cover them through the fees that, that the homeowners are paying. So that's not the issue. The issue is the startup, you know, because we're going to have, we need staff time, you know, you're going to, you know, Paul and, and Guilford are going to need time, staff time to plan for how we're going to do this. And they're going to need to have people on board as we phase this thing in. So that's the, that's the issue. We're going to have to come up with a way to pay for, you know, some number of people for some number of, you know, some period of time. And we have to estimate what that is um, and how we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll, fit, you know, we'll figure out what the cost will be. I don't know how we're going to pay for it, but that to me, I mean, Paul and Guilford, if you can, if you will have a different opinion of that, let me know. But that seems to me what we can do. Um, Athena. Um, it looked like Paul was going to make a comment as well, so I don't want to speak over him, but um, in terms of the finance committee capacity, I think the, the committee's agenda and capacity is one thing, but there's also a significant amount of staff to support that will be required to answer a lot of the questions that have been raised today. So just to, you know, we're, well, uh, we have a new finance director coming on July 1, and so that transition is also going to take a little bit of time in terms of the staffing part. We'll have to look at um, union contracts and so forth to see what we can do with exi existing staff and adding staff and so on. But it looks like Paul and Guilford might have something to add. Thank you. Paul? So, so I, I feel I feel your frustration, George, and and I know this has been lingering for a long time, and I think that everybody's feeling like, how long is this taking to do? There's also it's sort of butting up against the sort of blunt reality of there's no staffing to do this, and I think we we need to get a plan together, including a financing plan that says, here's what's the capital cost, here's the ongoing implementation costs, and what it looks like, and here's here's how we can move on that. I think, you know, once we get our new finance director in, start, she starts July 1, um, you know, that will be an added asset that we have and um, can add to this. But I don't, I think, I think it's really, you just, we can't underestimate the complexity of what we're trying to take on here. And I, I call it a new department, but it's a whole new service that the town does not offer right now. It's as if we said, we want to start delivering electricity to people and like, what was that? What are you talking about? It's a big thing. And I think the, um, the questions that you're, you can anticipate the questions your colleagues are going to ask when it comes to the full council. Um, they're going to ask the basic questions that any, any, any counselor is going to ask. And I think it's really wise for the TSO to get what they're going to deliver to the council. If we have a listening session, people are going to ask all th a thousand questions that we just don't know the answers to. We haven't made decisions unless we're just saying, what do you think about trash? I don't think that really gets us very far. We have to have a, a, a proposal. And again, I'll try and send you some of the links from the articles in Pittsfield. It is, it brought people out of the woodwork on these, on these things because you know, nobody likes change. <laughs> I like my hauler, whatever it is. Um, but I think, you know, the council is saying, what I'm hearing is the council is saying there's an overriding public policy goal here that is valuable to us. It's, and we're willing to, to put the resources together to put that, to do that. Um, but that being said, we should never, we should not uh, underestimate the, the commitment of time and resources it's going to take to move this ahead. George, because uh, I think I know where we're at, but well, you... I'll, I'll say what I think, and then you'll see if you agree with what I think. Where I, we're at is where you think we're at. 
<laughs> um, what I'm hearing is that um, we need, as a committee, to hear back from FinCom and perhaps with input from staff about how this is going to be managed from a staff point of view and paid for. And we need this information before we can proceed to recommend anything to the council. Now, I agree that in the original motion, it does say in consultation with the finance committee to review the proposed revision and make recommendation of a measure to the council. And so what that means, and I wish I'd understood this a couple of months ago, but um, is that actually one of the main things we're trying to find out is how we're gonna pay for this and how staff's gonna manage it. Um, and now apparently, and so I guess what, we're gonna have to wait until that comes back to us before we can proceed on this. Um, and I don't know when that's gonna be, and that's not my problem because I'm not the chair. Um, but uh, yes, it is frustrating um, because my understanding was that we move on the bylaw and then it goes to council and then council sends it back to FinCom and they start thinking about this and then the council decides whether they want to proceed or not, whether they want to vote yay or nay. But apparently what I understand now is that we're going to get answers to all those questions first and then we'll send that to the council. And it'll never have to go back to FinCom ever again. I don't believe that's true, but that's all right. That's where we're headed. So I just want my colleagues to understand this is going to be, and the public who's listening and those who have been advocating for this for some time, it's going to take another month or two at least before we can get this to the council. Is that your understanding, Andrew? Yes. Uh, right. Gilford? Um, yeah. Personally, you're not going to get any more information than you have already. Um, I th I kind of disagree with <clears throat> even the finance committee. What are they going to look at? They're going to look at the information we gleaned from the RFIs. You're going to look at the information that says that these vendors are willing to give you these services. You're going to look at the contracts that, that we, we've already looked at, and we've come up with numbers that say, if you do these things, these are the numbers you're going to have. Truly, the decision I think you need to make now is yes or no, we want to keep going. Do we want to put the time in it and have the staff do some through some process, go and get more information, which basically we're at the point now where we need to bring someone on board to help us lay out the RFP to actually decide we're going to do this service. Um, the RFP is contingent upon funding. All our bids and all our RFPs are contingent upon funding. Um, if, if you say yes, that's what we would do. We would bring somebody on board because like you say, we don't have the bandwidth. We also don't have the expertise to actually look at all the little ins, nuances to this. Every vendor, or actually not every vendor, Two of the vendors, they run a very complete operation with the other communities they work for. They handle everything, they but they charge for it. Um, but they handle calls, they handle complaints, they handle billing. Billing, um, they provide a the they provide the share that goes to the town to the town. The town takes that share and does what it does with it, or or the city. Um, you can set it up a million ways, um, but. Really, I think what you're doing now is saying, yes, we're taking the next step or no, we're done with this. And that's really where it is, I think, right now. Because you can keep asking the question and you can go back to finance committee and finance committee is just going to look at what we already did and say, well, these are kind of the prices, but we don't know this, this and that. And you're not going to get this, this and that until we say, yes, we're doing it and move forward with some people and, and put out a, a proposal that actually gives us prices. Or, or proposals, not prices. Sorry. So here's what I suggest that we do. Um, we've had substantial discussion today. I think it's time to cut it off. Um, we've had, you know, every member of the committee has said, let's move forward, that this is the thing to do, and let's get it let's get it moving so we have 
really achieved a consensus in the committee, even though we've not had anything to vote on. Uh, I think the next step is uh, I will make sure that everybody gets the original bylaw and original proposal so that we're on the same plane. But it was um, always the, the beginning working document. We recognized that it was going to have some changes to it before it was presented, all bylaws do. And um, the other thing that I think is important is to uh, make the, get the community and the council aware, which is what the memo is about. Um, and the last piece, as we've talked about, is um, how to handle the startup cost issue. And uh, we certainly will refer... Can, can and should refer that information to the finance committee at an appropriate time that Bob thinks that the committee can manage it. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I think uh, working with Susan, we should look at those grant opportunities and see where there is outside of that will be available to get us moving. Uh, but I don't know what else we can accomplish today. Susan? Is there somebody in the in town government that can look at a federal grant? Is that would that be like a Stephanie Ciccarello, Paul? Or um it it would be interesting to have somebody take a look at this federal grant that has just um appeared. So I don't know who that person would be. Do we have in-house resources to help with that? The, the composting grant is solely to set up a compo composting facility. It's not to implement collection. It has to actually process the material as well. Oh, it's a processing only? Did you take a look at it, Guilford? Yes. Okay. I, I just passed it along. I didn't look at it. Thank you. Sorry for stepping in. That's all right. So again, um, when we meet again as TSO, what Possibility, do you think, uh, Andy, there is that we might actually vote on this? Because I'm, I'm disgusted to death. Um, uh, but maybe others want more discussion, and that's great. I'll listen. I'm not, I'm just one of five. But I would like us to vote the next time we meet. Is that possible? Is that in the cards? Or to be determined? Let's take, uh, let me get the bylaw out that was originally proposed to everybody to look at because uh, we have to see whether there's a comfort level with it. I think that we're all in a different place. Some of us, it's just been a long time, even that we've looked at the details of the, of the original proposed bylaw. So let's get that moving. I don't, I, I, just a request that the bylaw be looked at by the sponsors beforehand and put in the best possible form they can, as opposed to us having to do that. I'm not sponsoring this. I would just like the sponsors to present the bylaw to us in the, the form they want it to be in, and then we can work on it. But um, it needs, somebody needs to look at it before the next time and just get it in the form that they're happy with as the sponsors. That's all I ask. Okay. Not in that shape at the moment, as far as I can tell. I will do that, uh, and uh, I'll check with uh, the two other co-sponsors and uh, the community sponsor. So um, I don't think that there's anything else we can do on this issue today. And I don't know if there's anything that anybody wants to bring up about the discussion that we had last time on uh, traffic calming speed limits, uh, those um, safe routes to schools. You've seen the, um, hopefully had a chance to look at what I sent last night. If not, uh, I think that kind of is where we are and uh, there are two actions that we need the council to take. And they're explained in the, uh, the memo. Uh, 
I'm not sure there's anything else to do, but I wanted to at least create the opportunity by putting it on the agenda. So if anybody has comments on that, please. Bob? Yeah, uh, this was a really a question for Guilford, I think. But um, when we're doing the um, the bike lanes on, certainly on Belchertown Road and elsewhere, can we put like um, the, the sort of, I don't know what they are, like posts that, you know, if you hit it with your car, it'll, it'll, it'll be on spring uh, to kind of delineate the, the uh, bike path. Cause uh, people, you know, the, 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 the information that we got is that that's, that's much safer for biker bikers. If, if you have some sort of physical barrier there, <clears throat> is that, can, is we, do we have enough space for that or? I mean, there's enough space to put delineators up. Mm -hmm. um, the issue with delineators though, is how do you remove snow? Do you take mm -hmm. them down in the winter? Cause when you plow the snow, you'll plow the snow into the delineators. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more of a, it's more of, they don't work that well in this area. Um, you, you could do it. Yeah. No, it, it, that's fair enough. Because uh, I, I do have an issue with with also with snow removal. I, I brought it up the last time. Um, if if we we can do a lot of improvements and get sidewalks so kids can bike on them, but in the winter, you know, yeah, there's snow days, but you know, school is closed. But you know, you've got 24 hours to remove snow from your from the walks. Um, it seems like it's going to be it could be a problem a snow removal from uh for kids to safely bike to school so we're gonna have to that's an implementation issue we'll have to deal with but i just wanted to bring it make sure it's not forgotten yeah, so Ryan, i first want to thank the chair and athena for putting the fifth grade presentation in our packet um i think it was was remarkable um and it's let alone from fifth graders, I thought it was, and so I appreciate that. And I think it's a useful resource, at least some of it for me. Maybe that just showed the level of my ignorance, but I thought it was, um, and I appreciate you putting it in there. Um, I'd hope that that at some future meeting, we can continue with this uh, discussion. Um, sounds like Bob would be interested in that as well, which is this whole idea of, of safely biking uh, to school um, and what uh, can be done, what's possible. Um, obviously, there are enormous challenges, but um, it seems something important. And I just I hope that we we can come back to this. Um, obviously, not today, but at some future meeting. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else to do. So, anything else? Uh, I have nothing else that I didn't anticipate in advance. Any other issues that anybody from the committee would like to bring up? If not, I'd take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, Councilor Lord? Aye. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Uh, Bob? Yes. And I'm a yes. So um, we are adjourned. Thank you. It's been a very interesting and helpful meeting, and I appreciate it. And the committee is adjourned at 11, I think it's 11.46, if I'm correct. So thank you. <laughs>